We sat stunned as we drove into Kabbalah. In biblical style, Saddam's troops had razed the town centre to the ground. What bloody battle, unseen by the Western media, had brought such devastation here, only 100 kilometres south of Baghdad? Of those who, urged on by the West, rose up against the dictator, there was no sign. How many had died? Possibly around 100,000 people have been killed uh, during uh, the uprising and af in the aftermath. There was absolutely no uh, instrument or infrastructure to control the population there. So they went on mass control measures, detaining people en masse, terrorizing them by mass killings and using brutal force, sheer force, uh, to keep them in control. And it has worked. Saddam had promised the mother of all battles, but in the end he fought it against his own people. That one of its bloodiest chapters was here in Kabbalah has tremendous significance. Even the Allies avoided bombing this place for fear of damaging the shrines here. For Kabbalah is the holiest city for the Shiite people, who make up more than 80% of Iraq's population. Picking our way through the rubble with our government-supplied minder, it's not too surprising that we could find no one who had a good word for the rebels. There is, of course, an official explanation for the uprising. And this was the main theme we heard repeated again and again, that the rebels were Iranians, foreign saboteurs who tried to destroy the country. As usual in Iraq, the truth is desperately hard to come by. You must understand that those who stayed alive and you saw in the streets of Karbala have witnessed with their own eyes that the holy shrines have been attacked and nothing happened, that uh, tanks rolled in into this holy city, killing people and crushing them, and nothing happened. They've witnessed that government troops killed children, killed women, and nothing happened. And hence they are so terrified, they'll say anything to stay alive. At the center of the battleground, and now terribly scarred, is the most sacred of those shrines, that of the Imam al Hussein, grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. Here was the headquarters of the rebels, their rallying point, and the place of their last stand against the Republican Guard. Large numbers of people died here, as if repeating the history of the Imam Hussein, who himself fought a doomed battle against a powerful tyrant. It cost him his life, and he wanted to demonstrate that one must give his blood in order to stand against tyrants. And since that time, that shrine has become a symbol of all movements that resisted tyrants in, the, in that region. And I think Saddam Hussein, by attacking that, he attacked the, the, the strongest or the most sacred point in a Shia character in an attempt to crush and frighten and defeat the Shias of Iraq. Signs of a terrible fight are everywhere. Huge doors in each section of the shrine have been blasted off their hinges to get at those sheltering behind them. 
the most exquisite works of enamel and tiles are riddled with bullet holes. Miraculously, the great chandeliers were mostly intact. But every square inch of the marble walls seemed to have been hit in the firefight. And in some places, the bullets were still there, embedded deeply in the stone. We know that during the uprising, that the shrine has become the, if you like to call it, the central command for coordination of the rebellion in that city in particular. And uh, obviously, uh, as the attack started, it was the last ditch very much in the battling ground and people fought to the last uh, minute up until they were killed. The shrine itself, because people believe it's a safe, a God, the given safe haven, they all took refuge in the shrine. This is something very deep in the beliefs and psychology of the Shias. And this was the scene inside, in the terrifying days before the government counterattack. Shiites chanting, save us, save us Iran. It's footage never shown before publicly, shot on home video and smuggled out before the last days of the Battle of Karbala. Watching these images for the first time, we felt we'd stumbled across the ghosts of a stillborn revolution. Men, women, children and tiny babies all crammed inside the shrine of the martyr who died fighting a tyrant. It's believed that most of these people too are now dead. As we filmed here, a solitary man was allowed past the centuries to pray at the shrine. The Republican Guard are still in charge here and had allowed no one else inside. We never found out why he warranted the special privilege of being the only man allowed to make his prayers here though it seems to me now that he was probably sent to us as an officially sanctioned eyewitness of the uprising. Whatever his connections, Abed Ali Salman, a Shiite himself, carried the papers of a retired government bureaucrat. He said he opposed the uprising and believed the army was right to crush it. A veteran of the Iran-Iraq war, Salman voiced the common Iraqi fear of Iranians, part of the key to the failure of the Shiite uprising. دخلوا ليس هناك ما تسمى بالثورة بل هم هؤلاء أكثرهم نحن نعرفهم بعضهم هم كانوا الناس الذي كنا إحنا متفضلين عليهم هم المقيمين الإيرانيين في محافظة كاربلا ناس كانوا هنا ساكنين شربوا ماءنا وأكلوا من أرضنا ولكن أنه ما قاموا بالوفاء لهذا البلد the war had left the apparatus, the security apparatus, in total disarray. And hence the local population found the opportunity and took it. It happened spontaneously. It was under nobody's control. Uh, local, what you can call them gangs or rebels, emerged and controlled the area. But obviously they had a lot of support from the population. Otherwise they would have not been able to take charge of the city for such a long time. The rebels were ecstatic at their early victories, but desperate street battles still continued.
while filming in the shrine, we were shown the room the rebels made into a makeshift hospital. It had been left as it was when the Republican guards stormed in. No one would tell us the fate of the injured or those who attended them. This is that same room at the height of the rebellion. Things actually got worse towards the end. In this atmosphere of terror, Saddam thrives. And wherever he goes these days on his whistle-stop propaganda tours, just as here in Babylon, city notables come cowering to give tributes and assurances that only degenerates had opposed him in the recent uprising. He has nothing to offer the population today other than the, the more killings and more brutality. Iraq will witness uh, the only industry that will flourish in Iraq is that of the killing industry because this is the only ground Saddam Hussein has to reassert his authority. But of course the West had no interest in aiding another Shiite revolution. Saddam Hussein, who's now busily rewriting history, has come out on top again. One of the enduring ironies is his own rhetoric, comparing himself with that great Islamic hero, the grandson of the prophet, Imam Hussein, for having stood against the West, against hopeless odds, with no chance of victory, just for the principle. <laughs>